Uh, good evening. Welcome to the latest installment of Building the Scottish State on Independence Live. I have the pleasure to have Kenny McCaskill with me again for, for the second hey. time in a couple of months. So first of all, Kenny, thanks for thanks so much for joining us. Pleasure. Thanks for having me back on. All right. Uh, tell us about the Alba experience. Uh, what, what, what um, you know, how is it, how has it gone down? What did you learn from the election? What did you just tell me about your, your, your observations on the, your, your recent Alba experience? Well, uh, it's a journey that we're on and uh, we've only just started. So uh, rumours of Alba's demise are not to be believed at all. It's something I have no regrets and uh, feel uh, actually liberated in many ways and look forward to working with colleagues once. And I think sooner rather than later that we're able to start meeting as steps are now made for a conference to come together. I think sometimes in life, uh, circumstances, the concept can be right, but circumstances are against you. Uh, mm -hmm. I stand by the concept of ALBA, a supermajority that we argued could have been delivered, mm -hmm. hasn't been delivered. Uh, we've seen one million, indeed over one million SNP votes, even more than in 2016, go to waste, returning unionists that could have returned a nationalist supermajority. But both the hostility, uh, the lack of time, the disgraceful behaviour by the media, in particular the BBC, it's quite outrageous that in 2016, Mr Coburn was allowed on BBC leaders' debates when they had no MPs, no councillors, but as with Farage, were given a boosting. Uh, it seems to be part of the course of the BBC. Meanwhile, Alex Hammond and other ALBA representatives were denied the oxygen of publicity. So the concept was right, but it just wasn't to be. Equally, ALBA goes on because there are fundamental things that we see on a daily basis that uh, have people questioning why they are or were in the SNP. Uh, and I wrote about that in an article today. But more importantly, the case for Scottish independence has to be driven on. We have to make sure that we uh, uh, don't just settle down, uh, as seems to be the case in Holyrood. Uh, we, we make that case, we forge alliances and drive on because this is situation critical for Scotland. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Uh, and, um, let's, and so what are, what are your plans in, uh, cause you're working of course with Neil Hanvey, uh, how, um, what, what are you, what are you going to be doing in the Westminster parliament? Well, to fly Scotland's flag and, uh, uh, to treat it, you know, with the respect that it has to, because it provides you a platform, but not become ingratiated or fixated by it. Uh, so I have been down the last two weeks. I'll be participating virtually this week and Neil going down this coming week. Uh, we don't take part in the pageantry, such as the state opening with the Queen's speech. That's not for us. Equally, you know, you do mind your P's and Q's. If you're given the opportunity to speak, then you don't behave in a boorish manner and we seek to make points. I was fortunate last week to be able to speak in a debate uh, that had relevance to Scotland because of World Press Freedom Day. I was able to concentrate not so much on the issues abroad, but I made that. Normally, I would like to have thought that speaking in World Press Freedom Day, I would have spoken about all the iniquities that are going on around the world in Gaza or whatever else. And indeed, I had to spend much of my time dealing with what I believe is a disgraceful situation that's now coming about in Scotland. Mm -hmm. I never believed, you know, in all my years that we would have the circumstances that we now face, that people are being interviewed by police, charged by the Crown, facing prosecution. An eight-month sentence for Craig Murray is appalling. That Mark Hurst was dragged through the courts is disgraceful. That other people are finding the police knocking at their door. It's simply unacceptable. This isn't what should be happening in Scotland. I've never believed in Scottish exceptionalism. I believe Scotland can do so much better. I believe we require the powers of independence to be able to do that. But equally, I'm coming to the conclusion there are some things in Scotland that, that we require to address and aren't constrained by independence. The role of the Lord Advocate, some of the failures of the administration, none of them are dependent upon <laughs> Westminster uh, in most ways. They're about Scotland changing how it acts and in particular how the government of Scotland behaves. Mm -hmm. Okay, and what do you think is the root the, the, what is the root cause? Is, is it constitutional? Is it a question of the of abuse of power? How do you how do you see it? Having you know worked in both, the... I think I think it's a mixture of factors. Some of it's down to individual decisions have been taken in the Crown Office by the Lord Advocate, by others, in particular the Crown Agent. They have to accept culpability of that, exactly the same as people have to accept culpability for the disaster that is the Rangers FC uh, case. It's almost going to bankroll the, the bankrupt the Scottish uh, court service. Uh, there's, in, there's 
structural issues in some shape or form. I actually believe that the judiciary in Scotland, other than trying to change the historic and ongoing issues we have relating to uh, class and a not being representative of a wider population base, but that's a challenge in every jurisdiction, I think, but it's why perhaps magnified in Scotland. But there are issues. I've always held the police service in Scotland up as being outstanding. I, I think it is still, but there are issues there. So there are structural issues. The Lord Advocates enshrined in the 1998 uh, Scotland Act. It will require some Westminster agreement to change, but equally it requires the First Minister to move quicker and faster. It's simply unacceptable that the chief advisor, the senior legal advisor to the Scottish government is at the same time the senior prosecutor in the whole of Scotland. No other jurisdiction that I know in a Western democracy, you know, accepts that. No other jurisdiction. And, and you the titles, you can have the name retained, but you have to separate the powers to something akin to what they have south of the border, where you have an attorney general that advises the government and you have a director of public prosecutions that deals with prosecutions with the prosecution of criminal matters. They are entirely separate. Mm -hmm. Okay, and, um, and and how did how did it work? Because you, you were justice minister uh, in the in Holyrood, correct? Okay, how, yes. how, did it, how, how did it work when you were there? Well, when Alex Salmon took over and you know, uh, Ailish Angelini continued as a Lord Advocate, I think, first of all, that showed that the Lord Advocate had previously served as a Lord Advocate in the Labour Liberal administration and was being asked to continue to serve in an SNP minority administration. Ailish did a remarkable job till she was replaced when she stepped down by Frank Mulholland. I think that showed that the Lord Advocate was to be neutral. Uh, there was no time, and I have to say, I... I didn't approach, it wasn't my call, Westminster for any structural change, but what Alex Salmon did ha create was a situation where the Lord Advocate only came to Cabinet to advise or speak on issues where they were giving legal advice. They did not participate in Cabinet as a member as had been before. Yeah. So I think that was the start of the separation. I think the Alex Salmon case has brought this into the public eye and it's you know something that should be dealt with fast it should have been something that should have been made quite clear in the election. Alba were making it quite clear. I think other parties should have said they would make it clear. And, you know, simply to be taking, you know, your time about it. There are issues in terms of how government advice is given, how matters are appealed. But they're not, they're not you know, inconceivable. Because, after all, it's done in other jurisdictions, even within the United Kingdom, as it is. Yeah. So, you know, the templates are there. They have to be revised for Scotland. The names and parliamentary approval requests to be done, but we cannot go on as we are, because as we saw in the Alex Salmon situation, as we're seeing ongoing, there is now a belief, rightly or wrongly, that uh, prosecution is being politicised, and that is fundamentally wrong in a democracy. Yeah. Okay. All right. Um, let's see. And so, what what, what would you put in? Uh, um, what do you think should be done? In preparation for for independence at this point, I mean, I, uh, I, you know, I've I've been working with this group with Jim Sillers and others, and we've been working on you know kind of uh, issues of international recognition and uh, constitution and, and things like that. But uh, but uh, and, and we're we've got um, we've got members from the SNP in, involved as well. Uh, it just seems to me as if there's no reason that these the you know the, the the basic structures of an independent Scotland could be built now. But it doesn't appear that the SNP is very interested in that. I, I don't know what, what your view is. Well, I think that's another reason that myself and many others have left the SNP. There is nothing being done. I'm of the view that, you know, much more than 2014, when the SNP was previous into Paris, I think we need to make sure that it's the wider non-SNP organisation that is running the case for independence. The Scottish Government, I think, you know, has issues and it can't be seen to be leading the case as was the case back in 2014. But work has to be done across the board. First of all, you need the structures. Uh, that has to include the SNP. It can't exclude them, but they're not the only party. There's not only ALBA. There's now a variety of parties and there's other people who are individuals. So you have to have the structures and thankfully things are being done by yourself, by your colleagues, by Scotland now, by others. But that frankly should have been done a long time ago uh, and the SNP should be stepping up to the plate. There's fundraising, you know, not it shouldn't be missing funding that we should be trying to locate. It's actually preparing the funds and, uh, you know, that appears not to have been done in any shape or form. And the uh, task force that the SNP set up under uh, Marco Biagi has quickly withered on the vine. Policies required to be brought in. 
We've had discussions on this, Mark, about how I believe EFTA has to be the route. But yeah. at the present moment, you know, if there was to be, as the SNP claimed to have wanted at one stage, a uh, referendum in the autumn, I don't know what would be the question on the door. If somebody said to me, what's your currency going to be? I don't know. Yeah. Where are you going to be in the EU or EFTA or not in anything? Uh, I don't know. Mm -hmm. What will happen to my pension? Well, we think it'll be all right. You know, all of these things are frankly, and we can't assume that the British have been doing nothing. They'll be ready. Yeah. People have had back office beings ready to say, Mr. McNaught, we know you like to holiday from Newcastle Airport, living in East and representing East Lothian. I know that. They'll have emails ready to go. We know like you like to holiday from email, uh, holiday from Newcastle Airport. Do you know you, that if you vote yes, you'll have to show your passport just to get to Newcastle Airport, never mind to where you're going. All of these things are ready. Mm -hmm. well, you get your pension paid in pounds. What will happen to you if you vote yes? So we should have been preparing. The lack of preparation is shameful. Mm -hmm. Heads should roll, not Marco Biagi departing from his position. Others who are in a primal position should have been accounting for this. You know, the most we've had from the SNP is a growth commission that was moribund and defunct as soon as it was published. And since then, we've had absolutely nothing. And the current position on the EU, as you and I have discussed, is frankly, I find incomprehensible. Mm -hmm. I would be hard to articulate that on the door if there were a referendum in this autumn. What is your position? According to the SNP, well, we don't know what it's going to be, but we're going to apply to get into the EU. What are you going to do in the interim, Dr. McNaught? Oh, well, <laughs> oh, well. <laughs> we hope it's going to be all right. Yeah, yeah, okay. Well, frankly, useless. Okay. Um, let's see. Do, do, what do you see as the uh, potential for, 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 the, for independents working, the independence parties working together? Do you think the Greens and the SNP and Holyrood will work towards that? Or do you see it more as Alex Salmon did, that, that both the Greens and uh, the Greens are sort of tepid on independence? How do you, how do you see that? Well, I, I've always found the Greens tepid on independence, but equally, to be fair, you know, uh, they did come out in 2014 officially for it. Uh, uh, and, you know, if we have to take them at face value, you know, so all parties other than those who are excluded because of their behaviour or neo-fascism or whatever else, you know, all parties and individuals who support it are welcome and board. So you're required to have the structures. So the structures required to be there. The SNP is the biggest party and that has to be acknowledged. And as a member of ALBA, I fully accept that. Uh, but what they're not there to do is to dictate everything. They have to work together. Uh, some things will have to be agreed democratically. Some things will probably just have to agree to differ democratically because after all, you know, the whole purpose of uh, independent Scotland is that we'll be able to make our own choices and within that we'll have different views as happens in every independent country. But we have to unite to be able to deliver that uh, and that's why we have to widen the base as far as possible. As it is, it seems to me we're coming to a situation where we're going to have to, you know, rally together to try and protect the parliament we've got, never yeah. mind obtain the independent parliament that we want. Yeah. And what is, uh, what can you tell me about the internal market bill and how, uh, and, you know, how it could, you know, how it could affect the, uh, the powers of Hollywood? Uh, but you, you, probably, you probably have a better, better understanding of it than I do. Well, you know, the short answer is we don't know. I mean, you know, the UK government are saying it's not there, it's necessary because they need to do that to be able to take all these European documents. Equally, you know, the clear fact is it does give powers that could, you know, drive a coach and thought horses through devolution. And, you know, where uh, anybody who underestimates their ability to do that, I think, is, uh, is deluding themselves. We were told that all we would require is an SNP majority and Boris Johnson would blink. Well, we've got an, uh, an SNP majority in conjunction with the Greens, and I don't see Boris Johnson winking. I don't know what the outcome of his discussions with Drakeford and uh, Nicola Sturgeon are going to be, but I don't think he's for shifting. And therefore, we're going to have to have, you know, uh, I think two aspects. We're going to have to defend what we've got, because that's under threat, and we're going to have to build alliances to deliver what we need. Okay, and what do you and do you what do you see as uh, uh, is you know Nicola Sturgeon seems to have kind of boxed herself in 
to a certain degree by by uh, saying that it's a Section 30 is the only legitimate way of achieving independence. And you sort of do understand that from, you know, you don't, you don't want the same thing to happen to Catal uh, Scotland as Catalonia. You, you don't want to be stuck in some limbo, uh, you know, not recognized for years, uh, this type of thing. But uh, what do you, do you see, uh, what do you see as, as legitimate, other legitimate routes to achieving independence? I know that, you know, if Alba had, Alba had been, you know, elected in large numbers that, Alex Salmon would, you know, you, 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 you all would be, you know, working towards something like that. But what do you well, see? There, legitimate there is no template. These things are about political power and political negotiation. Uh, you know, that's why, as they say, Alba thought the supermajority would have delivered and would change much more than simply the assumption that an SNP victory was going to see Boris Johnson blink. I think my uh, criticism of Nicola Sturgeon is twofold. First of all, in terms of saying it has to be a Section 30 order, then she's given the uh, she's given the time, she's given the decision over to Boris Johnson, who just says you're not getting it at the moment. But she's also ceded timing, because what we've seen is she said there's not going to be an independence referendum, so there'll be discussions about a Section 30 order, but there's not going to be an independence referendum until such time as there's coronavirus recovery. Well, when is that going to be? Because it certainly looks to me that we haven't yet even hit the worst of the economic fallout. Uh, it's understandable that the Greens were raising in the Scottish Parliament that furlough should be extended. But there's going to be a whirlwind when furlough comes to an end, extended or not. We haven't begun to see the extent of the job closures and the factory closures and all the businesses that are going to close. So the idea that all of a sudden we're just going to get the pandemic started in 2021 2022, we're going to get all sorts of bang dabby dozy and sort out businesses and we'll be all good to go in 2023 is fanciful. Those of us who lived through the 1980s remembered what it was like when factory closures started, when businesses were shutting. I think, you know, and I fear very much that what we're going to face is a significant recession, not for 18 months or so, but for years. And yet, if you don't have the powers of an independent parliament, then you cannot borrow. You cannot use that borrowing, borrowed money to construct infrastructure, to keep people in employment. So you've handed over the timing. And all that will happen is Boris Johnson, come 2023, will say, now is not the time. We're in the middle of a coronavirus recession. Go back and sort out and get coronavirus recovery and come back and I'll talk to you about a Section 30. In the interim, you said yourself, First Minister, you said there would be no referendum until there was coronavirus recovery. I'm telling you, the economic stats from Scotland look grim. And you're saying to me, you know, coronavirus recovery. I'm saying to you, go back and do it. So she has ceded not only the opportunity, she has ceded the timing to him. We now are dependent upon Westminster and saying, yep, coronavirus recovery is upon us. And I think that's going to be some time. That's why the argument for independence the structures for independence have to move away from the Scottish government and they have to move out of Hollywood. Okay. And what do you think could, could be done to educate the Scottish people on the voting system I mean, uh, about the, the, to, to get away from the, uh, the SNP one and two? And, to, and because, I mean, it was, uh, Alba came up, uh, came up uh, you know, they came up about very quickly. I mean, it wasn't much time for, for very, uh, what I view as legitimate reasons. Uh, but wh what do you think in terms of, uh, do, you, do you think most people understood the voting system or do you think that... Uh, uh, not as well as I had hoped. I mean, some of that, I think there was, you know, the SNP, you know, for their own political experience, they sought to pander to the SNP one and two. They knew that they had had a million wasted votes before. They ended up with 1.1 million wasted votes, but it suited them tactically because they were afraid of Alba. That says more about them and their commitment to the independence cause, I think, than anything. It certainly doesn't reflect on the hardworking activists in ALBA. I think, more importantly, the media closed ALBA down. Other than smears continually towards Alex Salmon, the coverage of ALBA was disgraceful. It was certainly nothing in comparison that has been given to other parties who had less of a base than ALBA had. And certainly the arguments that ALBA was making were not, I think, put forward. You know, Alba was always faced with uh, disparaging remarks about Alex Salmond, as opposed to, you know, an explanation about how the uh, voting system of the Scottish Parliament meant one and two was a waste. But it, that was a collusion between the Scottish and the British establishments uh, to maintain power for those that uh, are currently in situ in Holyrood and indeed in Westminster. Mm. 
Mm-hmm. And, and do you think and, and do you think there's any possibility? I mean, that, that there, there would be, you know, I, I don't know, a unilateral declaration of independence or uh, by the Scottish government or the Scottish, Scottish Parliament, an assertion of sovereignty, something that could achieve independence without um, the, the, a referendum or especially a Section 30 referendum? Well, I think at some stage you need a referendum, uh, whether it's a consultative referendum, whether it's a referendum that's ultimately to ratify what's been negotiated between governments. All of these things ultimately comes down to political power. It comes down to those with in power politically in Scotland negotiating with those in power south of the uh, south of the border. The idea that it has to be a Section 30 order, that is preferred, but it's not the only route. And indeed, you know, if a Scottish Parliament you know, took it upon itself, as Alba had argued, then I think it would have been incomprehensible that a Westminster government in a scenario that might have come to play had Alba been successful, wouldn't have been negotiating. So there's no international template that you download off the internet and say, this is what you do or don't. What was done in Catalonia can't be replicated in many ways because of the circumstances in Scotland. But the idea is a Section 30 order or bust is utter nonsense. There are steps you can do to pursue the case internationally. That wouldn't necessarily deliver because, uh, but what it would do is focus and that brings pressure. It allows you also, as you know, we come out of uh, the pandemic, people to start marching because we do know that, you know, these demonstrations that do take place do have an impact. So it's got to be across the board. It's what we do in the streets politically. It's what we do in parliament politically. It's what we do internationally politically. It's all about politics, but the idea that it's all about getting Boris Johnson to agree to give us a Section 30 order when he deigns that the uh, recovery has you know, been satisfied is nonsensical. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And uh, th- through the through the uh, through our research group, we we contacted uh, 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 one of our one of our colleagues contacted uh, people in the uh, in the Nordic Council, and there's no reason that uh, it, it all it would require is the Scottish Parliament voting to a request entry into the uh, Nordic Council uh, with observer status, of course, couldn't be full status yet. But uh, I mean, do, do you I mean, given your experience in the parliament, do you think there's anything pre- preventing that? I mean, assume, uh, I mean, I, I see nothing but will. I mean, I, I've been aware of that. I mean, the Nordic Union is a different situation that would require an independent nation and, and no. form alliance. And you wouldn't be I don't think that you would be welcome there. The Nordic Council, you know, I've had discussions over a decade ago with uh, Scandinavian uh, political representatives who made it clear then as now that, you know, there's a door there uh, that they would be open, you know, not even formal membership, but certainly observer status because, you know, the the geographical links are, are, are there, you know, the short distance across the sea, the historic links, you know, and other aspects. And indeed, I don't think you'd be giving away any secrets to say that I you know, was approached by the, an ambassador from one of those countries for my thoughts you know, in the run-up to the election. And that's always been the situation. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, I mean, I think that's something that we should seek to do. The uh, attack by the Tories upon Scottish government representation abroad is absurd. I, I saw that last week with yeah. a Tory MSP criticising. And I, said, I was I was walking through London to get the, the, the tube to get to King's Cross and to get my train back to Dunbar. And I came across on Paul Mall, the office of La Gachon de Quebec. I mean, these things are standard. You don't just have to be an independent nation to get out there and be represented. Mm-hmm. And I've met La Gachon de Quebec representatives who have been, you know, and their representatives tend to be much more political rather than civil service. This is the situation in Scotland. Mm-hmm. And they have varied between those that have represented the historic party Quebecois and those who have represented the Liberals, but all have sought to represent Quebec within, you know, the Canadian federal structure to the best of their ability. So Scotland should be doing these things. We mm-hmm. should be doing much, much more because the British Embassy does not always represent Scottish interests, sometimes deliberately, sometimes just because they're too busy. And at the end of the day, we're too peripheral and the Scottish government doesn't have direct interests. So seeking to piggyback on, because there are times when you will want to cooperate with the British government. And I've been I've had issues lately, even in my own constituency. So I've had to go through the through the Foreign and Commonwealth Office and I've been grateful for their assistance. But there are other things where if you don't sell yourself, nobody else is going to sell us. So that's why you know there should be Scottish representatives abroad and linking in with uh, the Nordic Council is eminently sensible. 
Yeah. Okay. Um, uh, let's see. Do you th- uh, uh, a question? Uh, do you think Joanna Cherry will join Alba, or maybe more obliquely, if you want to answer that, just that uh, uh, That's you know, a for Joanna, I'm friend for Joanna. As I respect her greatly. It is her position. I'm not aware of her changing her position from her previous statement that she was, you know, an elected member of the SNP, and that was where she was staying. I don't think I'll be giving away any secrets to say that Alba membership is still continuing to climb. And we'll be having announcements over, you know, certainly tomorrow. I was speaking to somebody earlier in the week who will, uh, who's reasonably high profile, who'll be joining. Okay. All right. Um, from James Reith, I've been an activist since the 90s. Up until a month ago, I thought indie was possible. I, re- I, I now realize Scots at the present day are so subservient to their English masters through propaganda and feared to take a risk that a 42-year-old, I'm confident it won't happen in my lifetime. Um, kind of pessimistic uh, a, 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 um, uh, appraisal. I mean, do you, do you see it that way? And what do you see as the, you know, uh, how are you optimistic for the future? No, I, I think uh, I don't blame the Scottish people. You know, they voted. Uh, I regret in some ways. It didn't. I certainly didn't vote for me. But you know, I certainly they certainly rejected Boris Johnson and did that again. I, I think they may have had misplaced hope and optimism in the SNP and Greens. But we'll see. They certainly voted for change. They voted for an independence mandate, albeit marginally over fifty percent on the list. But that was delivered, and the SNP were given an overwhelming. Uh, response on the constituency basis. I just think what sustains me is that the countries I diverge in, you know, I've been I've been in the SNP for 42 years, but I mean, I remember as a child, I, to some extent, the directions of Scotland and England have gone and are continuing to grow. You know, the position in Westminster, the union is much weaker than it has ever been, which is part of the tragedy of the SNP not seeking to push harder and faster. The union is rocking, you know, there is despondency within sections of the uh, independence movement, but equally, look on the other side. The union is not growing because they know how difficult things are because the union's message is not getting through. So I think it's a matter of persevering. It's a matter of pushing. We can deliver. We have to broaden alliances. We have to defend what we've got as well as going forward. But I think fundamentally, the people of Scotland do not like what is happening south of the border. And let's remember on the same day as, uh, uh, you know, as we were voting one way in Holyrood, Labour were getting thrashed in Hartlepool. Inconceivable in my past years. What, what, is, the repu- what, what is the reputation of Hartlepool? Very, very working oh, I, class, I very labour support. I would view Hartlepool as something akin to Motherwell. I was down there once in 1980 because I shared a flat with a friend whose father was a, was a brewery manager down in Hartlepool. And we went down there. It's a working class industrial town in northeast England. You know, you would have thought it was a sort of place where Tories would have feared to tread and instead they won it comfortably. So the divergence between north and south of the border on the constitution uh, is significant. That's why I would say to, uh, to our friend, keep the faith, it will come. Okay, all right. Um, let's see, uh, let's see. Uh, do you, do you expect an early Westminster general election around 2020 or three? How could that affect independence? Um, in other words, the SNP seeking an, yet another mandate uh, for a weary indie movement. Uh, do you do you see any possibilities of, of Westminster election coming up and whether that would, um, uh, w- how that could change things? All the talk seems to be that there'll be a Westminster election in 2023. And that is part of the Tory strategy, and it's the trap that Nicola Sturgeon has fallen into, because I was at the count at uh, uh, Ingleson, I was speaking to a Tory MSP, and I was saying, well, is Boris Johnson going to change strategy now that the SNP and Greens are dominating? Went, no, no, it's just, they're just going to play the long game. They're just going to say, you're not getting a Section 30, concentrate on coronavirus, and then, of course, in 2023, there'll be an election. Now, the SNP might win all the seats again, but what if they don't? What happens if in 2023 you get a reprise of 2017 when the SNP still won the majority of seats, but they went backwards? Uh, if that happens, then the position will be that they, you know, I've no doubt Westminster will say, well, you lost your election, you've not got a mandate, and anyway, we've not had coronavirus recovery, so get on with it. So this idea that you were deferring the referendum until 2023 
is you're deferring it to the next Scottish parliamentary elections unless you deliver an overwhelming majority in the Westminster election of 2023. Mm -hmm. That may be possible, but equally, at the height of a recession, when people are going to be deeply upset about uh, just how strapped public services are in Scotland, it might not be easy for the party in the Scottish government, as Nicola Sturgeon found in 2017, when the SNP were in the ropes on health, housing, justice and other issues. Mm -hmm. Okay. And what do you think, what, what could be being done now, do you think? I mean, what, and what do you, because I, I, I always thought about, you know, with my group and others bringing together all of the different groups that have worked so hard, whether they be the common wheel, whether it be the Constitutional Commission and others that have done this. And, but there's, but uh, as to now, there hasn't been any, uh, there, it's, it's as if the, the SNP has been presented with all of this good research, but there's been no effort, effort to tie it together to kind of build the foundations of the state once independence is achieved. Uh, and and I, it's my view that needs, this needs to be done, I guess, independently of the SNP. And do you have any ideas on that of how we could sort of, uh, you know, even, even in the independent, even in the absence of a, of a date of a referendum or even a means to get independence that we could, you know, begin to build, you know, what, what, what would be the Scottish state once independence is somehow achieved? Well, I think we do mean to do that. I mean, an ALBA will seek to play its part, not only in, in terms of what it does politically, <clears throat> in terms of electoral activity, but will also seek to build its part in, you know, using the resources, the brains, trust and the talent that we have within our party to try and make sure that we provide that platform on questions such as currency, pensions, borders, EFTA membership, you name it. Equally, I think we've got to give credit to those who have been involved in establishing groups such as Scotland Now and others bringing people together there are bright, you know, talented people there seeking to do things. The tragedy has been the SNP has been very exclusive, you know, and has been focused simply on becoming an electoral machine to deliver their own electoral return and not to deliver anything further or beyond that. So I think the way to do it is actually to make sure that we take it out of, you know, the political party structure into a wider grouping, although political parties of all size have to be represented, to make sure they have that, and we have to do it through those structures. Okay. All right. Um, so, somewhat skeptical comments here. Uh, waiting to hear how Alba would would have gained the right to self determination. I, I, imagine you had gotten, you know, a good, you know, maybe imagine you had gotten twenty five or thirty re representatives uh, in in in, uh, in Parliament in addition to the SNP and the Greens. Uh, what would you be doing right now? Do you think? And I, I know I know it's difficult to specify, and I know that uh, Alex Salmon simply said that he would begin negotiation on day one. But how do you, uh, you know, how would you see Alba have, how would it be different right now if Alba was in, had a significant representation in Holyrood? Well, I think you'd have rocked the foundations of the British state. All of a sudden, you would have had the Scottish Parliament, not the Scottish government, making polite requests, but the Scottish Parliament would have been convening, you know, for the first time with an independent supermajority. We'd be saying the electorate, the people of Scotland have spoken. Things are simply untenable. We're not prepared to accept it. We'd have been beating down the door to demand to meet with Johnson to say the people of Scotland have spoken. This is simply unacceptable. We require discussions now. And we'd have been seeking to take it, you know, as a pandemic allows onto the streets and taking it around internationally. So it would have been, you know, to be independence front and centre, not to see it booted down the road to 2023, when we know it's going to perhaps be booted down the road again because of a UK election or an ongoing coronavirus, you know, recession. Mm -hmm. Okay. And will, will Alba be standing in the next general election? Well, Alba will be standing in elections. You know, we're going to be standing in the council elections coming. We'll stand in by-elections if they come. And we'll, you know, we'll take each election as it comes. But, you know, we're now a political party. We have representations in Westminster. And, you know, we will seek to be retaining that. Mm -hmm. Okay. And, uh, and and how do you, and what do you think are some of the main changes that you would like to see in, in independent Scotland? So for example, electoral changes, like, you know, maybe instead of this weird DeHaunt formula that you have single transferable vote with open lists or this type of thing, what, what are the kind of fundamental changes you'd like to see? Uh, well, I mean, Alba's got to meet, you know, we've had difficulties. We've been meeting like this with Zoom conferences. We're going to have a conference in September. And and a lot of these things won't be for me, they'll be for the party to decide. We've got a, a skeletal outline of our policy positions, but we've got other positions that we'll require to discuss. Some of these things are also deeper and they're for the people of Scotland, ultimately, to, do, to, to discuss and decide. And Alba won't necessarily, you know, and, and these things hold sway if 
if uh, other views uh, take precedence. So I think it's about making Scotland better. That's you know obviously what I've come into it. I you know, I think the Dahont system isn't perfect. I prefer STV, uh, but uh, you know that's something we'll have to discuss, and others will have their say. Okay, and given your experience as Justice Minister, what what types of changes would you like to see to the judiciary? I mean, how do you sort of see once independence is achieved? How do you see a restructuring of the judiciary if if you feel that some is needed? And what would what what would be some of the changes that you would like to see? Uh, you know, especially given we, the given what we were seeing very recently with regard to the the role of the Lord Advocate, this type of thing. So. I mean I, I mean, I think, you know, the role of the Lord Advocate I'm very despondent about because I have to say I worked very closely with Ailish Angelini and with Frank Mulholland and I hold them in the highest regard. And uh, uh, both have gone on to do great things. Frank's on the bench and uh, uh, Ailish is just doing uh, remarkable about what north and south of the border. Indeed, I served uh, or worked with other previous Lord Advocates, albeit from the opposition benches, and I got on with them. I don't know where it went with James Wolfe. I always got on with him personally when he was dean of the Faculty of Advocates. He's a very bright man, but something went far adrift. Equally, I also would have to say that I think the majority of people who serve in Crown Office are good people. There are a couple, you know, in terms of uh, leadership positions, I think, who have taken it off the appropriate path. But those who serve in the Crown Office as procurator, fiscal deputies, all the way through to, uh, you know, those acting as advocate deputies, most of them, the vast majority of them, do so, you know, uh, with a, a, an integrity and an honesty. So, the overarching systems that we have in Scotland are correct. We do have to have changes to the structure of the Lord Advocate. We have to have separation of the powers. We do have to remove individuals because I think the Lord Advocate has to go. If he hadn't been stepping down, he should have been dismissed. I think the Crown agent has to look to himself because his behaviour has also had questions arising. So, you know, there's a few... What, what's the, sorry, what, what is the Crown agent? So the, 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 the Lord Advocate and the, uh, the Crown agent, is that the... Uh, the Crown agent would be best described as a senior civil servant within the, if the, if the uh, Lord Advocate and the Crown Office were a government department, they would be the, the Director General. The Lord Advocate and the Solicitor General are the equivalent of government ministers. The Crown, the Crown agent is the equivalent, perhaps, say, of the, 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 the Director General in the Department of, of Health, if it were. Okay. All right. Um, a question from uh, James. Uh, as an SNP member, I'd like to as, I'd like to have Kenny's thoughts as to what he thinks happening with uh, Mr. Mural's refusal to check the books or to provide the books. As a man who's been in politics for years, what damage do you think this is doing to the movement? Well, I think it's doing considerable damage to the integrity of the SNP. I served as SNP national treasurer. Uh, you know, wasn't an easy task, you know, uh, things were difficult, they didn't have Zoom in those days, I used to get, used to have to sign the payroll checks when, uh, you know, the cashier would come running along and I would sign the checks and she'd get taxi back from my legal office because I was still a lawyer, I wasn't a full-time politician in any shape or form, but equally all information was available to me, I knew where the money was, or more often where the money wasn't because we didn't have it, we had an overdraft at the time, <laughs> that might very well be the situation now, uh, so it is simply unacceptable that a member of staff, which Peter Murrell is, does not give the elected treasurer the full financial information. It's not only that he's failed to give it to Douglas Chapman, but he's failed to provide it to the Finance and Audit Committee that included, you know, Cynthia Guthrie, it included Frank Ross, it included Alison Graham. So it seems to me that, you know, democracy is not operating within the SNP, which is one of the reasons that I left because it is simply unacceptable that Peter Murrell uh, should not be giving that information to the elected members. Uh, you can go back even further. I can't think of any scenario in which a chief executive and you might call it the chairperson you know, would be husband and wife. And frankly, why this has persisted since 2014 is ridiculous. But you know, that's a matter for SNP members, not for me, I am out. But what I can say is probity is required in public office and even in organisations that are, you know, ostensibly not uh, public and are membership organisations. If there's issues going on in the bowling club down the road from me, then I think public interest remind, demands that it's addressed. And when it's going on in the governing party in Scotland, 
then I think I can understand why you know, interest is taken, not only by the press, but by other, uh, other bodies. Yeah, okay. And uh, that gets me back to a point I, I wanted to ask you about with regard to the account, uh, you know, the, the question of accountability. And I was reading an article earlier today about just saying, even like five years ago, it would seem as if, you know, that, that uh, politicians were somewhat accountable. If they did something really bad, they would get fired. But we see with this Johnson government, I mean, you know, I mean, all of these things, whether it be the, you know, the corruption with the, you know, the PPE or all, you know, I mean, you know, or the redoing the, the number 10 flat, all that, there just doesn't seem to be any mechanism to, uh, you know, I mean, normally, I mean, I don't know, I mean, if, you know, there, there should be a way of, you know, of removing someone from office if they're obviously, you know, you know, industrially corrupt. Uh, do you do you do you see the same? And how do you view the again with regard to the UK specifically, and and the, and the Scottish government? How do you think that issue of accountability has evolved over the years? And do you perceive this the same thing that maybe before, while not perfect, there was some ter- ter- type of accountability? And the administered was run, would resign if there was a scandal. Whereas now it doesn't seem to it doesn't seem to matter what happens, and the, and the ministers stay in office. Well, I, I think it's quite disgraceful. I mean, what's been happening south of the border, whether it's Pretty Patel, whether it's Mike Hancock, whether it's Robert Jenrick. I mean, the circumstances are really quite shameful. There seems to be no accountability. Uh, things are not as bad in Scotland, but equally, there's also some extent, you know wider than simply politics into governance, you've got no responsibility. You know, the Crown Office could have a black hole of 100 million because of malicious prosecution of Rangers FC. Nobody has resigned. You know, the permanent secretary of Scotland runs up a bill of half a million, appears before a public inquiry in the eyes of the world watching it. Frankly, you know, it was lamentable in terms of the evidence she gave. You know, her and other senior officials came across as, you know, second raters and in, incompetence. And yet nobody resigns and on it goes. So I think there's a problem in that politics has, has been very much traduced. You know, there used to be a sense of honour. It's being undermined. You know, even in the Tory party, you know, we've seen, you know, I, I never got on well with the likes of Dominic Grieve. You know, I didn't agree with him, but he was a man of principle. And yet yeah, you know, yeah. he's almost been hounded out. So I think there's, you know, there's something deeply corrosive happening to our body politic that's frightening. Some of that comes around because of the whole environment of trashing politicians, uh, encouraging career politicians, uh, and it's uh, it's you know it's concerning. You know, people go into politics. I think in the main because they wish to give public service. The trouble is, what's happening at the present moment? Nobody in the right mind would want to go into it, rather than the deeply committed, and that's a that's a damage to democracy. So I think what's going on south of the border is disgraceful. What worries me more down there, which is why I'm concerned that we're not moving far enough and fast enough to try and you know, provide ourselves protection to get out. I mean, they're taking over down there. When I was sitting on the Justice Committee, just about every appointment of anybody coming in for something had either been a Tory donor, a former Tory MP. Or, you know, there was no reason you, wouldn't, you could preclude their appointment because they met all the criteria. But there was just something disconcerting Whereas previously, people would have been coming in who had no political affiliation or indeed sometimes a political affiliation mm. from the opposition party. Now it seems to be that everybody coming in has some relationship with the party or government. And that is not good. It's not healthy. It's Trump-esque. Mm-hmm. Yeah, OK. Um, and and do, you, do you think that boils down to uh, not having a written constitution and not having or is it more a, a human thing? Or I mean, how, how do you how do you see that? I mean, do, do you think that- I think some of it you have to put in the media, you know, in terms of the traducing of, of politics, politicians, you know, that is a culture there. I think, you know, you have to, have to question why people would want to come in, you know, if you're going to get lambasted, have your life put in the shop window, et cetera, et cetera. So I think that's damaging for us because you have to get people into politics, to, you know, from all walks of life. Uh, and that's proving difficult at the present moment, and I think that's that's damaging. So, you know, the corrosive nature there, I think the the personalization of it, so it's, it's, it's a wider political culture. When I first went into politics, you know, you know it was much more ideological. Mm-hmm. People thought about ideologies, and, you know, you might disagree with them, but you knew they were coming 
perhaps it's also also a factor that you know as the divide has got less it's all become about power and that has has corrupted as well uh you know i think we've managed to avoid it because of the con in to the same extent because of the constitution but i think you know we have to try and you know be prepared to to you know work across the political spectrum but it's a it's a wider thing because it's not just here in scotland you know i think in or in britain i think it's in western democracies uh there has been there has been a a, a retreat that, and democracy is 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 suffering and we, we require to we require to sort that out as a society we've got to stop just viewing politicians as all being chancellor charlatans you know you can disagree with them but actually you know there are good people in all political parties you know i could think of you know bob neil who was a tory in the chair of the justice committee i don't agree with bob's position but actually he's a, he's a decent man i can't say that but all the tories down there so i think we've got to try and encourage good people to come into politics in all no political parties, and sadly, too many good people are getting driven out. Yeah, and what what do you see as the role of the press, uh, especially especially the Murdoch press? In the, I mean, it just seems to me as if um, I I don't know who chose the you know whether it was Theresa May or whether it was uh, you know uh, uh, Boris Johnson, but I mean, it it just seems very murky how they became be, became. Um, you know, prime minister, I, and I, and I, you know, I've I've studied the media a lot, and certainly have looked at the role of Rupert Murdoch and his press. And how do you how do you see it? Uh, how do you see his his role or other media barons? Well, I think it's deeply insidious. The power that uh, not simply Murdoch but Rothermere and the, the Mail have is uh, is deeply concerning. Uh, you know, they make or break. You know, the Tory party. They make or break. You know, British politics. That impacts upon Scotland. They have created a culture that is damaging. All of these things, it's not simply murder. You know, this goes back across, you know, the Atlantic to, you know, the likes of the Koch brothers, you know, yeah, there are yeah. oligarchs, you know, rich billionaires who are manipulating, you know, the democratic process, undermining it, and that is damaging for us all. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And we see it in other countries, not just Scotland and south of the border. Okay. Um, a question of, of, regarding around the, 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 uh, the, 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 basically the idea that there was these big mutual attacks between the SNP and ALBA, and that you've had, you know, rude comments exchanged on both sides, and that that might put people off. How do you, do you have any reflections on that? Well, you have tried to assuage it. I think you'll find that, you know, those as acting as spokespeople for Alba during the election, you know, sought to I always advocate SNP1. I voted for Paul McLennan and, you know, made that quite clear and I'm delighted he's been returned. Equally, I think, you know, there were people who went off message, if you can put it that way. We have no control in, of every individual in Alba. Equally, I do tend to think much of the uh, criticism was directed more by the SNP towards Alba, but that's that's a matter for individuals to decide. Is it helpful? No, but Alba's now here. We have the right to challenge the SNP when we think they're failing to deliver, such as, you know, I think this idea of postponing the referendum till 2023 is just kicking it down the grass, continuing to hope for a Section 30 and all that. So we will challenge them, and we'll challenge them on social and economic issues because, you know, I've got issues in my own... Uh, my own constituency and the Scottish government's got to, you know, got to step up to the plate. You know, taxi drivers are suffering, businesses are closing, they have to do more. You know, I listened to Professor James Mitchell, who's actually a constituent of mine, but somebody who I've known and considered a friend for many years. You know, and much of the criticism he has said about a middle class, middle of the road parliament is quite correct. Hard times are coming. And if we're going to protect the poorest in our society, then hard choices are going to have to be made. I hope and believe that Alba will be up for that. Mm -hmm. I just hope the Scottish <clears throat> government's prepared to be. And and what um, and it, without independence, uh, what can the, uh, what what can the Scottish government do to mitigate this? I mean, you know, there's and and I mean, it's all it, it been I don't know convenience the right word, but I, I mean, with so many social problems, they've you know, well, Scottish governments of all stripes have been able to say, oh, it's Westminster, it's they've got the powers. What 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 powers? <clears throat> Does the Scottish government currently have that could mitigate things like helping taxi drivers and helping helping businesses stay afloat uh, relative to what what powers they you know Scotland would have with independence that would be more effective? Or well, I mean, the first thing to say is politics is about priorities. You lay out your manifesto and you decide where you're going to spend it. And if you, you know, if you don't spend it on building council houses, and I think, you know, the, the ambition to build, you know, 100,000 over 10 years is derisory. You know, 
10,000 per annum new council houses is not enough. We could probably do with 5,000 in East Lothian alone, given the growth of the population and the uh, needs on the, the waiting list. So that's about political priorities, where you spend. It's not easy for government, because if you spend on something such as building more council houses, then you're going to have to take it out of some other budget. But take it out, it must be, because that has to be a priority. Equally, the shameful failure of the Scottish government to deliver onshore jobs as a result, as a result of the bounty and the bonus that we've got from offshore wind is really quite lamentable. I've got the, oh, oh, the energy coming ashore into Kikenji and into Torness, and yet where's the jobs? Where are they? You know, where are these turbines? Why are they being built in Humberside? Why are they being built in Indonesia? Why is it that we're not demanding that they get built here in Scotland? So there have been failures as well as a lack of ambition. So the Scottish government, you know, can blame a lot on Westminster, but there are issues such as the Lord Advocate, where actually no, there's steps you can take here. And if you want to build more council houses, then do it because it's not just about addressing the need for homelessness. It's about keeping people in work. It was President Obama that talked about shovel-ready projects back yeah. in 2008. When you're facing a recession, as we are, then the best thing you can do, and you know, to be fair, the government is restricted in its current borrowing powers, so they have to be demanding more. But with the current money it has, then it's got to get shovel-ready projects, uh, projects and actually building and retrofitting houses is, is the priority. <clears throat> All right. <clears throat> Uh, what is the, your view on the McGrory case being knocked back? I'm not exactly sure what that means, but I think they're talking about. I'm talk, I presume they're talking about Lockerbie with the yeah. with the uh, the court. I thought it was probably correct. I mean, you know, anybody who knows me or has followed, you know, I never thought that Mr. McGrory was an entire innocent. I always thought and believed he was not the bomber. Uh, but the idea that he wasn't involved in Libyan services and that it was Libya that did it. Uh, was fanciful. So I think, you know, the Court of Appeal took the view that, you know, was the evidence overwhelming? Was there doubts about the conviction? Yes, but in the totality of the situation, he had a role. It was a minor player, but he was a player all the same. Okay. Okay, well, we'll start to wrap up wrap up the uh, the conversation for this evening. Anything you'd like to uh, to say or just uh, explaining about you know Alba's future and how you see the independence movement going forward? Well, I think the independence movement's got to got to move out with Parliament, which is why I welcome Scotland now and other organisations. It's got to be open and inclusive, which is why ISP, AFE, all organisations and none have to be, you know, welcomed aboard. Those structures can't be dictated by ALBA, let alone the SNP. So we're required to do that. I think we have to start taking our voice out to the streets as well as, I say, taking out with Parliament. That will come sooner rather than later as, you know, lockdown begins to ease. We can get our trestle tables out and we can chat to people. We can start marching again that's necessary. We've got to lay the policy platform and, you know, answer these things because we have to be able to address, you know, how would you have dealt with the coronavirus crisis if you don't have your own currency and central bank? How are you going to be able to deal, you know, say you don't want a hard border, which I don't believe the people of Scotland want, but the rest of the UK, if you're going to be, you know, the hard border of the EU. So, you know, we have to get our thinking caps on. So, as I say, it's widening it, as uh, taking it out of Parliament, widening it politically, doing the policy work, and, you know, building friends and alliances. We have to, you know, speak to people because... I also thought that back in 2019, when you know we were first elected, the SNP should have called a Scottish Constitutional Convention. That has not been done. There still should be a Scottish Constitutional Convention, not just for Westminster MPs and MSPs from Holyrood, but for senior council representatives and for other body politic in Scotland. It should be done not simply to say, where are we going to go forward? It should be done to say, how are we going to protect what we've got? You know, so we actually have to build alliances because if we are going to face challenges with the internal market bill, then we have to bring devolutionists along. People who might say, I don't want to support you with independence, Mr. McCaskill. Well, you should at least be prepared to stand shoulder to shoulder to make sure that what you've got and what you wanted in devolution isn't reduced. So I think we've got to broaden and go forward because this is about democracy and it's about the health and welfare and well-being of our people. You know, when you come back to the point, what should the Scottish government been doing better? Well, we've got to up our game on drugs because we have a real problem in Scotland. We do need powers over misuse of drugs. 
Equally, we also need a, you know, a lawed advocate with a bit of backbone not to prosecute people for trying to set up drug consumption rooms and save lives in Scottish streets. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. All right. So um, unless there's any other questions, um, thank you very much. If you could stick on for a couple minutes after, I'd, I'd like to have a, have a week chat. But uh, okay. All right. So uh, thank you, everybody, for, for watching and listening, and we will see you again soon.